thanks to the yeah. Conservation yeah. District and, and to you guys for having me. I want to clear up a little bit why I'm here so that uh, you don't have unreasonable expectations. <coughs> I don't have any particular insight into any of this. Uh, I'm a farmer like you are. Uh, looks like with less experience than a good number of you, certainly less experience in this jurisdiction than all of you. Uh, so I'm like you out there every day trying to understand this puzzle. Uh, I have enjoyed and been impressed working with this conservation district in NRCS. Uh, grew up in Minnesota even though I was in the hospitality business. Uh, my folks were a skip generation. The rest of the family was in agriculture. So they had good extension and good conservation districts. Uh, we also do in eastern Washington. Um, I don't remember what they were like when I was in practice in California, but, but in my view, this is a particular strong conservation district. Uh, Nicole uh, especially has come to eastern Washington and helped us with, a, with an air quality program. Uh, tremendous amount of respect for her intellect and energy. Uh, I've seen the same with Chris and the others in this district. So basically I am here because they asked me to be and I'm glad to be here. But it's not because I know anything more about any of this than any of you. I think uh, Nicole and Chris have helped us a lot on this dairy and recognize that I have a little different way of articulating these issues than some others and they thought that might be useful. Time will tell. My main disadvantage, which is sometimes an advantage in that, is that I'm simple-minded and so, you know, on the surface, uh, the dairy industry is pretty complex. These nutrient management issues are pretty complex. Uh, but for me, that's beyond me and so I tend to think about it in real simple, uh, broad-based terms. And I think perhaps that's why Chris and Nicole thought this might be useful. It's, it's sort of stepping back from the details of what we're doing and, and trying to remember why uh, why we're doing it, why we domesticated the ox in the first place and what makes that system work reasonably well or not. So the rough working title is Revisiting this link between land and cattle in the new economy. So there's two parts to this. The new economy, I think the dairy industry looks uh, spectacularly different than it did even over the short time that I've been in, 23 years. Uh, one of the things that made me want to come back to the West from the Midwest is the, was the Western dairy model. I thought it was spectacular. In the Midwest, we had small integrated farms and there were significant periods of time where the, the livestock didn't get much attention. And when I came out here, People really focused on livestock and they were very good at it and it, they were bullish. Uh, the Western dairy model was uh, remarkably successful and vibrant and taking market share from that dairy industry. <coughs> 20 years later I wake up wondering most days whether that's still true or not and uh, to what extent it's true or will be true or won't be true and so I think there's two important things here is this new economy and what that means to the link between land and cattle and how useful uh, from both a regulatory and economic standpoint it is to consider nutrient life cycles. So first short section I want to talk about the new economy. And you know it's, it, it's been a trend over 20 years where the, the US cattle herd migrated west to the western dairy model and uh, th those dynamics seem to be shifting a little and I took a pretty short period from 2007. This is an accounting summary for a group of dairies that dairy in Washington by Gensky for the first quarter of 2007. And I really, this is an economy class, but I wanted to point out that at that time, pretty short time ago, we were spending about $6 a hundred weight on feed. And if you looked at the capital and cash flow structure of the dairy feed was less than 50%, and it mattered quite a bit how you were capitalized or, or to what degree you have captured scale, labor efficiency, things like that. And it was very survivable to have little or no integration. 
the energy paradigm was different. It was cheap to transport things long distances. And, uh, the regulatory interface uh, was not as prevalent. We hadn't concentrated livestock to the extent that we have now. Uh, so, and that's not that long ago. This is just a different accounting firm, same idea. First six months of this year. I actually don't like this one, it's per, this is per hundred weight. So in the last one per hundred weight, the number we were concentrating on was feed cost per hundred weight, it was six bucks. This one is kind of cool because it, it looks at all of the Western dairy industry, Southern California, Central, Bakersfield, Arizona, Idaho, New Mexico, Panhandle, and us. This accounting firm does not have a huge portfolio in the Pacific Northwest and is pretty new here. Again, he's been around longer. This is Fraser. But I think the bottom line is pretty easy to see. Instead of six, we have 10 or 11 or 12 bucks per hundred weight in feed. And the Western dairy model looks to be a little more threatened than it once was. Where scale and climate, which I think were our huge advantages, are not as big a part of the total pie as they once were. Create some structural challenges. Uh, the good news is I think that may direct us back toward a model which is more sustainable both economically and uh, in terms of the ecology. Here's the history of agriculture. Uh, I, I, I use this slide a lot in different sort of talks. But the truth about agriculture in general is food gets cheaper every day. And I, this, this just sort of reminds me that we might be careful to, to not focus completely on the current circumstances and try to put them in a longer term context because in general this is in real dollars, not nominal dollars. This is inflation corrected. But since post-war time, feed, food gets cheaper. Uh, and, you know, this is corn and wheat and beans, but if you put a milk chart up there, it would be similar in uh, the inflation corrected things. And, and we currently have a spike, but we've had them before. This is the energy crisis of the 70s. This is a smaller energy and corn crisis in the mid-90s. That's sort of when I started to think about why I was doing what I was doing, because it wasn't really working out very well. And then we have this new one which started in 2008 it's you know continued it's even more out of control than this and it's tempting to think that some part of it will stick more than some of the prior aberrations in the tree did but i think we have to be careful about it here's the other part of our world not just the not just this you know it was a government policy that caused corn to be two and a half bucks it's a government policy that causes it to be eight bucks we've never really seen the market in feed we've never in this country during my career seen the market in feed we've seen an artificially depressed market that sort of encouraged us to develop this western dairy model they yank that rug out and replace it with a new one that had the opposite effect so the economic value of corn was never two bucks and it's not eight bucks either but we have to live with that sort of volatility in this system. This is class three, this is corn. So we can take it both ways, right? And, and these, these curves are correlated over time, but not necessarily at any instant in time. So we get these backdrafts like 2009, when we have milk down here and corn up here, the backdrafts are what keep me awake at night. You know, the average is fine, but you gotta live through it. Corn is the same thing. This was the old, this was the old government program that kept corn for long periods of time. This, is, this band represents 98 to 2005. Corn was two bucks plus or minus, just as milk was 12 bucks plus or minus. Uh, but that was, that was an aberration. I mean, that was not the true economic cost of feed. We thrived on that, but you know, coming from the Midwest and you know, being indirectly associated with agriculture, I knew nobody made corn for two bucks without government programs. And there, so there was this underlying threat that was always there that this is a mirage. Again, you see the current scenario. This is Iowa. So the Western Dairy Model buys its corn there. And that used to be a corn surplus state. And they would subsidize freight out to us. So the basis was 30 cents, 40 cents. And the price was two bucks. And we could afford to dairy on that. 
Then they came the ethanol business and more livestock in Iowa. Now Iowa's actually a corn deficit state, so they're no longer interested in selling it to us for two bucks or subsidizing the freight. So here is the structural layout of the industry and the challenges that I think about. It. If the Western dairy model is not going to have the free pass that it once had, what do we do about that proactively? Over a long term, I mean, there's no easy answers. I sure don't have any. Even the long term answers, I think, aren't clear. Uh, they're a little easier to think about. So what are our structural challenges and opportunities if the Western model, and again, it's part of my disclaimer, remember that I'm sort of exposed to the Western model in general, which did a lot of these things to excess that I think did not happen in Whatcom County. You know, I'm not, I'm not as familiar with Whatcom County as I am with Idaho or Eastern Washington or California, and, and we took some of these principles to some pretty great extremes that I think you did not. So, I have a habit of not being politically correct in how I look at some of this. Don't take insult to that, and I do understand that you've kind of done a better job already at this than we have in some other parts of the West. So, we're here transporting raw materials long distance, and then making milk and, and, manufac and making manufactured milk products for which most of the market is also back there. And the advantages of economies of scale and climate may no longer be enough to overcome that, and I think you can see it already in production reports. They're taking their market share back. Washington, California, Idaho down 1, 2, 3, 4 percent. Wisconsin, Michigan, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana up 4, 5 percent. So this is playing into their hands pretty good. It's not that the price of corn in the market <coughs> isn't 8 bucks back there. <coughs> But they're growing it, and it doesn't cost eight bucks to grow. It's only eight bucks because of the ethanol mandate. So that integration is, is serving them pretty well. And if we intend to compete with them over the long run, uh, we need to think about how to level that playing field a little bit, or our cows will be on trucks. Why is any of this germane to the conservation district, or NRCS? The Western model gave up integration and, and thrived. I think we'll be forced to look at it again and from, the, from my perspective and from the conservation district's perspective, I would assume that's probably not a bad thing. I think the advantages that are available in integration, not necessarily under one ownership, but to relook at the link between land and cattle. Again, I said when I came out here, I was so impressed with the dairy industry because you guys were good at the dairy industry. And I'm not sure we need to go back to small integrated farms. I am more convinced that we need to integrate land and cattle. There's a variety of mechanisms to do it. And uh, this talk is sort of looking at some of the opportunities that exist there. Again, the cheap corn thing encouraged intensive dairy production rather than extensive dairy production. That's just another way of saying the same thing. We concentrated cattle and didn't necessarily tie them to a land base. And I mean, even if you go back to the, the food curve, the price of food curve, there's a lot of good, good things about that. We, we concentrated people in the population centers and we concentrated livestock, including uh, agriculture in general, but livestock in another area, and we fed off each other and, and got good at it. We've strained that relationship a little bit because we haven't communicated with them, so that's this line about the public's perception of our sustainability. I think this is a tremendously responsible and sustainable industry, but we haven't convinced them of that. And so as we think about these sorts of things, we have to be more willing to talk about it out loud. I think we're doing a great job. They're not aware of that. Somehow we need to figure out how to say this out loud enough that they are aware of it. Hey, you're right. Global marketplace, so it's, it's not enough that um, we're going to have to think about protecting our market share from the Midwest, but I understand there is a group, a crowd of people that think that the government will somehow provide a solution to this. And, and, uh, I believe in democracy, but currently it is uh, dysfunctional enough that I think you know we need to address a lot of these issues through the market rather than sit here and wait that they'll somehow fix it. They have a history of fixing it in some pretty uh, not so constructive ways. 
This is that global marketplace, and I find this pretty encouraging. The, 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 the width of these bands represent how big the dairy industry is. So we spend a lot of time worrying about New Zealand. It is this big. The European Union is this big. We're this big. You know, they can't run. It's not big enough to keep us from accessing the global market because the global market is bigger than them. The height of the bar represents current cost of production as of about 2011. So that's also encouraging. We have a big industry. These guys that are cheap producers down here aren't that big, and so we should still have access to those markets. Even in even having said that, look where our costs are relative to those people that 20 years ago I lived in fear. When we were 12 bucks, they were seven or eight bucks, and there was no chance that if there was a, a, a market for a load of milk, we could compete with them. We're getting very close, and uh, you know, some days of course we want to whine about that that our price isn't better than theirs, but it's also exciting. It probably represent some opportunity. All right, that's the economy part. Now to the part that is more interesting and what we do every day. So back to the simple-minded thing. If you go to those accounting summaries and notice that since 2008 to now, on at least half the years, we will work all year for nothing or less than nothing. Once in a while we make a little money, sometimes we break even, sometimes we get our butts handed to us. And so you can't avoid asking the question, how useful is this? And I put that question this way, why did we domesticate the ox? Can we create enough value with the cow to make a living? I'm obviously convinced we can or I wouldn't be here, but I think it's useful to think back to why we did it and, and whether the original reason we did it is the way we capture value. In my view, the reason we did it is because that animal could utilize the whole plant instead of just the fruit of the plant. So humans can only digest the fruit of the plant. They have no use for the rest of it. This cow has a unique characteristic in the rumen fermentation mechanism that allows her to use the whole plant. So we can take more of what we produce in agronomy run it through a cow and create some very high value finished products. Very important to think about the value of the raw materials to the finished product when you think back to why we domesticated the ox. If you take 40 cent a pound feed and produce 20 cent a pound milk, it's probably not going to work. And it's, you know, surprising the degree to which I have fallen into that trap, we've fallen into that trap, we're, we're feeding these high price feeds even when the, when the conversion rate and the price of milk doesn't warrant that. <coughs> I sort of, being trained as a veterinarian, most of you can recognize that, that, that we think high-tech tricks are pretty cool and that they always pay, and the truth of the matter is I'm not sure they do. When I was forced to run the checkbook and not just leave the farm every day, uh, that got called into question. So here's this car. And the theory behind putting her on a farm and making food is that we could take cheap raw materials, cheap energy and protein, and create higher value energy and protein. I wanted to use this slide to think about where do those come from. If you think about energy in general, whether it's in the cow or in humans or in your car, what's the source of most energy on the planet? We do split some atoms, we do have some wind machines, we do have some solar, but virtually all of the energy on the planet is carbon. So in, in terms of nutrition, that's carbohydrates, anything from as simple as sugars, to starch, to fiber, to fat. It's all carbon-based energy. When you get in your car, it's carbon-based energy, hydrocarbons instead of carbohydrates. So all sources of energy into the cow are based on carbon. Nitrogen, we're a little more creative with. And uh, nitrogen is building block for protein. Obviously, protein is a requirement for this cow's diet because there's a lot of protein in milk. If you look at milk, it's on a solid basis, it's half fat, half protein. So a lot of carbon, a lot of nitrogen. One of the most impressive reason, one of the impressive values of the cow is how cheaply we can supply her with energy. 
all of the carbon she eats originated as a free energy source. Sunlight. So when you grow a plant, you know, we, when we think, when, you know, for me on the surface, when I think of growing a plant, I think the plant is growing from something in the ground. Not true, obviously. Most of that plant comes out of the air. The plant only gets its minerals from the soil, including nitrogen, for the most part. But its carbon is a pretty cheap source. CO2. Sunlight, CO2, and water creates most of this plant. So when we go out to a field with manure, <coughs> the carbon that's in the manure is not a feed source for this plant. It stays in the soil for the most part. Right? And again, I said in the beginning, I don't know any more about any of this than any of you. So Chris, if I'm wrong about some of this, just mm -hmm. remind me. But So we have a cheap source of energy. Sunlight, CO2. Nitrogen, not so easy. Nitrogen has actually gotten pretty expensive because the nitrogen we usually think about other than manure is sourced from <coughs> fossil fuels are a big part of their manufacturing cost and so that's not cheap. We have a couple of cheap alternatives to think about useful in the, in the reason behind domesticating the ox which are manure and legumes and, and the more we take advantage of that the more our costs are likely to be competitive and uh, our business model survives. Always interesting to think about, you know, when you put gas in your car, you expect to be able to use all of it, right? That car keeps going until the tank is empty and it either stays in the tank or is burned in the engine. Our whole system is subject to some losses. And again, to try to, try to figure out how I can be competitive or how I can produce a product that the market pays a price for, where my cost is less, it seems straightforward to try to limit the losses. The more of these nutrients I can keep in this system, uh, the less money is going away and the less risk we're creating in terms of sustainability. And there are, the cow in terms of capturing these nutrients is very similar to an internal combustion engine once you burn it. Uh, 30 percent. So if we look at the feed we feed to a cow, about 30 percent of that gets converted to meter milk. The rest of it doesn't, but is to a large extent still available to the system. 32 percent would be a pretty good nitrogen efficiency in a cow. Same is relatively true of energy. So that's not too different than an internal combustion engine, except in an engine, when it's gone, it's gone. With a cow, we can get another shot at it. This is the shot, and you know, I wish we had a deal to spend on this slide. I do from time to time because this is how I think I can reduce, control at least, reduce the, the cost of my finished product and capture the value of the reason we domesticated the ox. This is with the help of my 15 year old and pretty poor, pretty poor explanations and technology. This is my view of how nutrients flow in this system, where we lose them, where we gain them, where we create value. Obviously, this is the 32% that gets sold as meat and milk. That has a relatively high value compared to the sunlight, CO2, and water that produced the plant. Right? No breakthroughs here. I promised you that in the beginning, right? So I don't know. But, you know, you, you, you feed the plant, then you feed the cow, and I started with the plant. So where does this come from? I think we already went over the fact that the carbon comes for free from sunlight and CO2. There's some, I think about feeding crops basically the same way I think about feeding cows. What, what, what are their requirements in terms of the simplest elements? Nitrogen, phosphorus, potash, energy. <coughs> Uh, and what do I have that will keep me from buying them? And it's really stunning. I mean, I, I guess the point, probably part of the reason I'm here, and the point I wanted to make here is that if I could break even selling them or only lose a buck, but could capture this value, 
it would need more than enough. So here is raw manure in a pen in eastern Washington. As received, 18 pounds of nitrogen, 6.5 pounds of phosphorus, 31.8 pounds of potash. Pile of manure. I have a large crop farm. If I have to go to one of those crops and supply those nutrients in commercial form in rough terms, and this is also part of the new economy, I used to be able to buy them for a quarter. Very short time ago, nitrogen was a quarter, 25 cents a unit. Now it's a buck by the time you get it applied, or close, 70, 80, 90 a buck, depending on the recent cycles, but generally a lot closer to a buck than a quarter. Same is true of phosphate and potash. And so again, there's losses. We really have no way of, of, of collecting all of this, but we start with the opportunity that one truckload of manure, 10 wheel, in terms of fertilizers, worth 700 bucks. In a semi, it's 1400 The Western dairy model treats that as a waste problem. You can do it again with compost and, and uh, I guess I'm just being sort of an irritating person. I like to point out some of the shortcomings of some of the alternatives that the public is most impressed with compost. And, and, Digesters, they tend to like better than raw manure. Seems asinine to me. Uh, <laughs> compost is nice, it's beautiful, we haul it 200 miles, it has great value. But the fact of the matter is we've lost some of its value. I won't spend a lot of time here, but if you look at as received ratios of nitrogen, and phosphate, and potash, and understand that phosphorus and potash aren't very volatile, the nitrogen is, you look at these two slides together, it would prove to you that I've lost at least a third of the nitrogen by going from raw manure to compost. It's a much warmer, fuzzier material to my neighbors, but it's not that. Certain times of the year, obviously, we don't have latitude to do raw manure, and you have crop rotations that prohibit you, but in, in my mind, the more raw manure I can put on a crop or before a crop, it's the most opportunity I have to capture the full value of the manure. Once I start handling it, the more I handle it, the more I lose. And they're in love with digesters, which, you know, are cool. You know, especially where we've trapped ourselves with large numbers of cattle on small acres, numbers of acres. They do shrink the size of the package. Again, you lose a lot of nitrogen there. You're still left with the phosphorus and potash. And so if you think it's a good idea, like I think it's a good idea to nutrient mass balance for phosphorus, then you really haven't done anything except burn the carbon. Right? Don't consider that, really. Cow pies, even. So th th that's kind of solid manure, and then you get into liquid manure, and there's still pretty impressive value in even raw cow, just the liquid form. For me, and I guess part of the reason I like coming to groups like this is that you usually learn something in the hall, is the more dilute this stuff gets, the more my cost of handling it gets close to the value, in which case I don't get to take out anything, right? Its value becomes its cost, and now I'm just running around in a circle burning diesel but not making any money. So to me, I, I sit at night and try to think, how could I dairy without water? You can't get paid to haul water, and the more we... You know, that, that solid manure where I can get paid 1400 bucks to haul a load is a lot better than... So, straight cow pies are 85% water, or, you know, roughly 15% dry matter. That load on a 5,000 gallon tanker is still worth 500 bucks. It's sure more than my cost of running it around, as long as the land is closed. If you get more dilute... Oops, forward. So this is what, I, you know, Eastern Washington, again, Middle Pond, but when I try to deal with my lagoon here in Washington County, I'm really lucky if I can get 6 to 12 pounds of nitrogen, and so that's just telling me, I know what a cow pie is, I've just diluted it that much, and, and this gets to be more of a break-even proposition, and I think in one of these prior talks, somebody referred to the value of 
Let's move the solids. You know, we just, I can't figure out how to make that happen on my Ferndale dairy, but I know it would be useful if I did. I had some other slides on a different thing that I was going to show you, but we'll skip it. How are we doing? Oh, and macro. So, same thing, right? So, we, we just looked at a bunch of nutrient profiles in manure. And the good news here, they are remarkably similar, though not perfectly similar, to the nutrient profiles in the crops we built. And I just ran through this. Here's a, that last one. So here's a nutrient profile, again, looking at nitrogen, phosphorus, potash in the crops we grow. In this case, it's grass silage at 35% dry matter, corrected. No, this is as received. So here's a 16% dry matter grass, 5.5 protein. Each ton is 17.6 pounds of nitrogen. That's straightforward math. 2.2 uh, .2 pounds phosphorus, 15.6 pounds of potash. If you're yielding six tons of dry matter, 18, 20 tons of grass silage, that's 300 pounds of nitrogen, 37 phosphate, phosphorus, 267 of potash. A lot of money if you're buying it. There's probably going to be the one slide that Nicole made it think was <coughs> worth traveling this far to see. <coughs> we have this huge opportunity in the value of our manure. A load is worth 1400 bucks, or a load is worth 500 bucks, until you have met the needs of the crop, in which case its value goes to zero. Right? The only reason it has value is that we can produce, we can capture carbon in sunlight, CO2 in sunlight, because of these minerals that we put there. Once we've reached the threshold where more it does not grow more crop, the value of manure goes to zero. So, here's two soil samples. I will pull up those. Uh, let me pull up those other slides. So I had this this grandiose scheme here. Here's a look at the pictures. This is a test going back to the uh, the economic slide, the financial slides. There, there, there. There, there. Income or expense? <coughs> Pretty simple to answer, I guess. Oh, you can't read that. Oh, wait. wait, wait, wait. <coughs> so on this field, it's income. On this field, it's expense, right? On this field, the needs of the crop have been met. So I'm just hauling manure to haul manure. Its value is zero. <coughs> on this slide, if I haul manure there, I grow more crop, that's income. Again, I said in the beginning, right? No breakthroughs. I'm just here because Nicole thought I would say it out loud, and it's what you guys think every day. I'm dumb enough to articulate it and puzzle about it and ask every smart person I see, including them, how do we do this better? If the milk is only breaking me even, and I know there's value in this manure, how do I make that work? I don't want to go extra, because that's worth zero. I want to find a way to use it usefully. I understand clearly how much easier th that is said than done. I mean, the, the Iowa land slide, land price slide. Does anybody think it's a good idea to go buy land right now? This far above the trend line, that's bloody murder. So it's not like we can change the Western dairy business model by tomorrow and, and somehow then we're able to capture this model, then we're more able to compete with the Midwesterners or the New Zealanders or anybody else. It's easier said than done, I understand that. And even beyond that, even when you have a large land base, you have this situation where if you look at the profiles of the nutrients in manure and the profiles of nutrients in the crop and the profile of nutrients that a cow needs, they're not a perfect match. So you're always going to buy fertilizer or 
export manure to some degree to get in a situation where you are not building <coughs> phosphorus. So I worked on this. That price, corn price spike, I came to, came to the West, incredibly impressed with the Western business model, wanted to copy that. Started in 1990, copied that. In 1996, the first time I remember at least the price of corn getting completely out of control and dairymen getting sued by people. And I said, hmm. I'm at a lot of risk here of working all year for less than nothing and ending up with less than nothing. So we tried to integrate the thing, and, and to some degree, we've gone a long way toward that, to where <coughs> I think on, on, in one of our operations, we nutrient mass balance to phosphorus, which I think is our future. Right now, we spend a lot of time talking about nitrogen. Um, that, to me, is not that difficult to nutrient mass balance in nitrogen because it's, we can grow crops that use a lot and it's pretty labile. So that's not much of a challenge in terms of acres of land per cow. That's probably one, uh, five to one or even ten to one if you do, if, uh, with the right crop selection and the right atmospheric conditions. But in terms of phosphorus, it, in my experience, is it's pretty close to a pair per acre. So if I'm feeding a cow and raising her heifer, I need an acre of land in a part of the country that is massively productive in terms of sunlight and CO2, right? So I can grow, on this farm that I have here, I grow less than half the dry matter I grow there. And it still takes me an acre of land per pair to nutrient mass balance for phosphorus. So I end up buying two or 300 tons of nitrogen. And that works, that's great, actually. I'm, I'm getting all the value I can out of manure, and, and uh, you know, again, I think it's part of the reason Nicole had me here is that I'm not shy about saying that system works for me. It's been a long time since I've got beat up, and it, uh, I think it, it gives me some comfort in that I can compete with the Midwesterners, probably the New Zealanders in that model. But here, tougher. Um, everything's broke up and high priced, and what do we do about that? And even over there, you know, we go, our expansion in cattle doesn't always line up with our expansion in cattle, and so it drives me nuts to have one of my neighbor farmers agree to take the manure, but then treat me like a second class citizen, like I have to pay him, or at least he's not paying me. And somehow I think there's some opportunity in the Western model in, in our current concentrated cattle, which again, I think is a great way to dairy. I don't, I, I don't, blowing this thing up and spreading cows out. I think, to some degree, threatens our competitiveness. But still, we have to reconcile these nutrient flows and capture their value and be responsible in terms of sustainability. And we're getting to the point, one of the disadvantages of concentrating cattle like we have in Yakima County, and to a lesser degree here, is that the farmers know there's plenty of this stuff, and so they're reluctant to pay for it. But as nitrogen, one of the nice things about nitrogen going from 25 cents a unit to a, to a buck is we're making some headway there, and I think there's a lot of opportunity in that regard. I don't, you know, your crops are different here, and I'm not sure how berry farmers look at manure. I'm sure you're getting it done. Uh, but I think we, we have, just as we have some opportunities to explain to our consumers how sustainable we currently are, we have some opportunities to convince our neighboring farms, even where we choose not to integrate or can't integrate, to let us capture some of that value. And in some cases, the only, the only place I can capture a lot of that value is on a crop, is on an acre that I control. But we're having, even in sunny stuff, where there is too many cattle, we are now able, you know, based on a sales effort, to capture quite a bit of value. Now, I got several clients, or a couple of clients, selling manure for 17, 18, 19 bucks a time. So we're getting better. Again, it's not its full value, but it does more than cover the cost that we incur on the dairy anyway from handling it. More of the same. I, I think in several feed slides here, I'm going to skip them. But in several, several feed slides here, I was pointing out the opportunity that some crops take up this more than they take up this. Therefore, you end up out of balance. There, you can bring in another crop. Some crops especially are capable of luxurious uptake, so 
they're happy to put on biomass at 2% phosphorus. They're probably capable of three. I think that's that's more true in the case of potassium, where a crop can thrive where its tissues are 2% potash, 2% potassium, but they're capable of pulling up 5%, which gets to be a huge amount. So, you know, it's pretty important to that plant, I think, that these things are not only there in adequate quantities, but they're in correct ratios, or the ones that are out of whack take up the absorption sites and outcompete the ones they need. And so we need, you know, at least on our farm, we can, we can grow a better crop if we keep the ratios right. The manure we deliver is not in perfect proportion to the, what the plant needs. And so we end up rotating these plants, crops around to try to balance that out. And to me, the only answer has been to balance the phosphorus and buy nitrogen. I think one of the only things, uh, one of the only opportunities I present in a setting like this, again, I'm going to say it another time, you guys know more about this than I do. I tend to have spent a lot of time studying cattle nutrition, maybe more than some of you. And there's an interesting aspect to that. First, uh, when, I, when I think about feeding a cow, and the economics of feeding a cow, and the biology of feeding a cow, there are some incredibly good programs out there in terms of balancing diets and looking at the wastage or the shrink. How much are we spilling of this? How much are we spilling of that? Really good programs in terms of looking at a set of feeds, looking at a cow and her given level of productivity or growth or need to maintain a pregnancy and saying, here's what she needs. Here's some feeds that will supply it. Arrange them in this proportion and you have a diet. The hardest part for me, and it goes back to this question of why we domesticated the ox, I have not yet met a program that can answer. So when I work for my clients as a nutritionist, or when I work for myself for a nutritionist, nobody attempts or has a way to answer the question, what diet are we formulating? We work it the other way. I got a cow giving 80 pounds, give me a diet. That's easy. You just buy this and you buy this and you buy this. The harder part for me, and, and Cornell has done a reasonable job around the edges of this, but still not produce software or smart systems for answering these questions that satisfy me. The hard part is, given the resources that I have available at this farm, what should that cow produce? We have, as an industry, we've been trained either by ourselves or by veterinarians or academics that more is always better, right? More milk. Wake up every day, check the tank. If it's up, we're good. I have a strong suspicion that that's not true in the new economy. That it will make more sense in terms of being competitive to look at the resources we have and say, from that information, say, this is the kind of cow I should make. And I think it may be 20 or 30 or 40 pounds lower than the kind of cow I thought I should milk 15 years ago. And, uh, you know, we sit in these communities and watch different strategies around us and kind of get some feeling of how that's going and whether we want to adopt those strategies or not and whether this guy getting 100 pounds is better off than this guy getting 50 pounds and you know that's that's a puzzle because everybody lies in the coffee shop but, <laughs> but you know one of one of the unique opportunities I had for 10 years I, I served as an advisor to a very large agricultural financial institution very large that institution had a very large dairy portfolio. And in that advisory role, I had access to anonymous data. Your farm credit advisor doesn't know anything about your business, but he does get to look at aggregated data. And as I was struggling in the early 90s to keep the whistle off my door and feed my kids, It became clear to me that when I graduated as a veterinarian, I was pretty sure you just open the faucet. And the more you can get it open, the better off you are. More milk, more money, better. And that wasn't working for us. 
I was broke as broke can be, and really not not even a ray of sunshine as to how I would get through that. And remember that when I got out of school, I went to Southern California, and there was people like, and I won't use names, this guy over here, and this guy over here. Totally different business models. Totally different levels of production. And five years later, no ability to predict who's still there and who isn't. The DHI trophy was not a good predictor. I knew that for sure. And so when I was at the bank, it was very interesting to look at these <coughs> aggregated data, huge numbers of data points, and pull them out by size of dairy and amount of milk per cup. And it is my opinion that neither one of those are useful indicators of cost of production or profitability. Small is rough. Small is rough. But at one point I thought, you know, I really don't have an appetite to run a 10,000 cow dairy. That's a nice way of saying I don't have the money to run one. <laughs> so to what degree is what I do do threatened by one of them? And I was really interested in that data. Is this 7,700 cow dairy or this 10,000 cow dairy going to run me out of this business? And I can say with some certainty, I don't lose any sleep over that. And I think the small side of that is a pretty remarkably small number, especially in the new economy. And then in terms of milk per cow, I would, I would say again, I don't know anything more about this than any of you. I've looked at the data, that doesn't mean I know what it means, but I would say that above some number, scale gets to be a disadvantage, and above some level of production, there gets to be a disadvantage in terms of staying power. That was radical to me being trained as a veteran. But there's this sweet spot in both production and size that are, that are pretty durable and pretty competitive. Uh, but it is a much smaller <coughs> number in both aspects, milk per cow and size of the dairy, that I think has the most staying power based on the way I interpret that data. And the only reason, you know, I went through that whole rigmarole there is to say, I think the Pacific Northwest will still be a great place to dare if we take advantage of these principles. I don't think we're going to get run out by the Midwesterners or by the large dairies or anything. I, I think we can really be competitive. I think there's a lot of money on the table in this regard. I think it's the assurance of sustainability that our customers need to keep our industry, aside from individually. But I, some, some of the things that keep me awake at night are the degree to which our customers are no longer in love with the idea of a dairy farm. And so you see the shrink in fluid milk maybe affecting other categories, and I think some of that is conscience. It's not just preference, it's conscience. And, and that's disturbing to me. I take particular pride and satisfaction in being one of the people who produce food. Part of the reason that food keeps c continuing to get cheaper and why we can feed as many people as are on the planet sustainably, I think we've done a bang-up job of this. And it frustrates me to no end that some days they view us as criminals. And I think getting this out in the open and what a nice job we do with this is going to help our markets in general besides our individual businesses. Back to this. You know, I got way late there and that, you know, the hardest part for me in formulating a diet is what level are we formulating for? Is it 90 pounds, 80 pounds, 70 pounds, 60 pounds, 50 pounds? And I think we ought to look at the resources we have available to inform that decision rather than just assume more is better. And that will make it a lot easier to cap capture local resources. Capturing local resources is important because if we haul a lot of feed in from outside and that feed has nutrients and we only capture 30% of it when we send the milk out, then that means we have a big chance of building up part of that that is not that sustainable and conservation district aren't the only ones concerned about that. Here is, I want to look at three of these. So here is, um, so this is just a generic traditional western diet. Let me pull this up. This is, I'm calling this conservation district ration. Well, it's got a little alfalfa, a little corn silage, canola, distillers, grass, corn, molasses, wheat. 
Um, what is it? Let me go back to another screen here. It looks like from the standpoint of protein in, it'll support 80 pounds. From the standpoint of metabolizable energy in, it would support more than that. I always do that on purpose. Um, if you if you don't lead production with energy and instead lead it with protein, you create some significant challenges to both reproduction and body condition. So I always try to build these diets with more energy than protein in them. When you do that, back to the slide I wanted to show you, you end up capturing about 32% of the nitrogen in. This is the slide I wanted to use. And and in this particular very robust program, I love this nutrition program. It not only looks at what the cows needs, but it looks at what you're spilling and therefore what's available to you in the crop enterprise if you want to capture the value of those nutrients. 32% of the nitrogen being captured, of the nitrogen losing, that you're losing, this is kind of what I'm trying to point out. 23% of the total is in the year and 44% in feces. And the reason I want to point that out is I concentrate on that, and if I'm looking at nitrogen losses and I want to capture that value, it's a heck of a lot easier for me to capture that out of feces than it is urine. So you can not only look at how much nitrogen you're spilling, but whether it's in the urine or feces. If it's in the urine as ammonia, it goes through the urea cycle in the liver, it's converted to ammonia and spilled, gone. So either volatilize off the cow pie, volatilize off the lagoon, some of it remains, you spread it on the field, volatilized in terms of ammonia and how much nitrogen is in the ammonia. I'm going to throw a number out as to how much of that nitrogen ever ends up entering a plant, and I'm going to call it 15%. Google? Yeah, okay. Urine. Done 25. 25. <laughs> In feces, a lot of that is organic, a little bit of nitrate, but a lot of organic nitrogen. So that's not very labile. That's not very, certainly not volatile and, and not very mobile or labile. And breaks down over slow time, which kind of matches nicely the life cycle of the plant. And so I spend a fair bit of time. For one thing, if I can get into 30s on nitrogen efficiency, I think I've done a decent job. And if I can keep more of that in the feces than the urine, that's also a bonus. So let me look at this. Let me look at the range of possibilities out there. When I first came to the West, I came to Snohomish County, and that was in the late 80s, and that industry was pretty robust. Ah, I mean, reasonably robust. It's heartbreaking to drive through there now. And why was it robust then? I think it had, you know, it was, you know, Western Washington was the, I think, and I don't know the history here, but it was the origination of the dairy industry in Washington, and it was kick some butt. And now you drive back there, and it's gone. What happened? Yeah, people maybe, but I, you know, I think, you know, because this other model was so successful, we tried to adopt that, and to some degree, it wasn't as successful as we thought it might be. So here's a grass diet based on 16% protein grass. Not, not going to be able to support as much milk. These are too closely balanced for me, but they're okay. A hell of a lot better than leading with protein. So it's a bit less milk. If you look at efficiency or losses, you're still getting 32%, 33% of that nitrogen into the milk where it has value. And you have a really nice ratio of how much is in the urine as ammonia and how much is in the feces as organic nitrogen. These are hard to digest plants. This diet is built primarily on grass, almost nothing else. And pretty decent efficiency. Not a ton of milk, but I'm keeping a lot of nutrients in that system. I know some of the world, and especially nostalgic consumers, are in love with, with uh, the red barn and the cows on pasture. And when we do that, we tend to want to still get a lot of milk. And so I built the same diet. But because I'm frustrating with that 16 or 15 percent grass in terms of how much milk it produces, I want to cut the grass younger or graze it younger. They'll give more milk because there's more energy there. There's also more protein, and it is a catastrophically disproportionately amount of 
higher protein. And you end up with some huge costs and losses there. So let me look at, now we're back to supporting 80 pounds of milk or plus. We're starved for energy, but we got all kinds of protein, these two numbers. So we're back to the conventional diet in terms of how much milk we can support from energy, but we have a hell of a lot more protein capacity than that. So what happens to this cow? Milk's her butt off, right? Loses weight pretty fast, doesn't get pregnant, spills a lot of nitrogen. I know she's spilling it on the pasture and that's all warm and fuzzy, but she's only capturing 19% of that nitrogen is milk. Only two thirds as much proportionally as that other cow. Over half of the total nitrogen fed is in the urine. So yeah, she's dropping it on the pasture, but it's gone, gone, gone. Grass helps to capture some of it, but it's gone. And only 20% of that ends up in feed. And that, that goes back to this question. If, if I think grass is the best resource Western Washington has, my question is, what kind of grass? Mm -hmm. Unlike all of you, I like it when my tank is fuller than when it's not full, but does the check look like it? One of the things you'll see here, and an easy way for you to monitor how this is going, not everybody, not every nutritionist thinks about this, I guess, and we don't ask them to. So one of the ways to think about what's happening inside the cow here is this metabolic slide. This is the weight loss. When you spill nitrogen, when you have excess protein, that actually creates a caloric cost, an energy cost, to run that through the urea cycle in the liver and dump it. In this particular cow, that's 1.74 megacalories of energy a day. That's enough for about six pounds of milk. So she's taking that much energy off her back, most likely. It's putting her, what did that not fit on the slide? Let me see if I can slide down here. It's putting her at this risk in terms of P-U-N, M-U-N. Bill, I can't see the. What does the MUN say? MUN there says 22 PUN. So pla PUN is plasma urea nitrogen. The milk is always going to have a slightly lower amount of that because of this blood alveolar barrier. So it's saying 22. So have you, is this, can we ask questions? Yes. Uh, have you determined what's uh, the most acceptable range for MUNs? Next slide, please. <laughs> Recognize that report? I can't see it. So. Yeah, this is a this is an NDA MUN slide, and I, I don't have you know I don't have an answer to any questions, but and specifically not to that one. But I always have a guess. I have trouble having cows reproduce without question above 14, probably above 13. I'm using energy that isn't milk at 12, and I am crippling this cow in terms of productivity below nine. Crippling this production? Yes, starving the system, starving the system. Combination of soluble protein, rapid carbohydrates, the rumen. I'm starving the rumen if MUN is below nine. I'm spilling at great expense if MUN is above 12, 13, 14. And I, you know, I've only, you know, I've only worked on this in groups, so I would encourage you not to look at individual cows. You'll see some extreme numbers. I look at the collective, the bulk tank, and I'm pretty comfortable in this range. Uh, so, so the end of the green slide is at nine. Yeah. There's probably some lost opportunity there. Certainly there'll be days when you're below nine. You have opportunity in that room that can capture this sunlight, CO2, and water. You're missing that opportunity because you've starved it for nitrogen. The opposite effect is if you're above 12 or 13, you're, pardon the expression, pissing money away. 